During his first anointing, David went out, uh, sent by the father to check up on his brothers who were at, in a battle, in, at war with the Philistines. Just like the father sent Jesus to check on Israel and the Pharisees and the, the lost sheep of Israel. So when David arrives, uh, what does he see? He sees his brothers who are resentful of him because of the anointing that he got from Samuel to become the king over Israel. And all of them, the old, from the oldest down, were jealous and envious. Uh, so when they saw him coming, uh, naturally, they resented him and made fun of him and laughed at him. Uh, but he saw the giant, the enemy. And it's interesting to note at this point that Goliath, as a type of the devil standing down in the valley, yelling up to them, uh, curses on a daily basis, taunting them, saying... Send me your best man. Pick one from amongst your uh, troops and send me your best man. Just he and I will battle. And whoever wins the battle, the other's army will be servants to the winner. So I'll take on your, your, your savior or whatever. You just send him down here and let me fight that. Your best. You pick your best man. Now, how many of us pick Barabbas or somebody else? How many of us would pick uh, somebody besides the meek and mild lamb who's willing to die on a cross and be, be humiliated and, and shamed and, and humbled to that degree in front of the whole world? How many of us would pick him to be our champion, to go out and fight the God of this world, to go out and fight against all the powers of darkness and put our hope and our trust in him? See the paradox? You see the difficulty there? Um, but isn't that God? He uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. His ways are not ours. They're far above. His weapons are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. So when David came and he saw this giant, the first thing that he did, he found out all that was going to be offered to the one that beat the giant. Uh, and this is the, this is the redemption of the kingdom. You see it. And all of this, remember, is in this first stage of Passover. All of this has to do with the cross. All of this is pointing ahead to the deliverance of the lamb. So he's, he, he's sent to the king. He's escorted to the king. Now remember, he's anointed to become the king. And here is the king. Well, uh, David goes up to meet the king. And at first, the king doesn't uh, believe that he can do it. But David finally convinces the king that he's able. I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. See, he has a testimony. He overcomes by his testimony. And so the king tries to send him out in his trappings. There's a temptation here involved. And this happens in the flesh. We always try to complete our uh, calling and take the appearance of godliness. Now, uh, this happens many, many times. People aren't patient. So they wind up uh, taking the king's armor. Like David was offered Saul's armor. He said, here, try on my armor. Take my shield. Take my helmet. Take my sword. And by the way, while you're at it, go out there and fight him in my, in my name. He's trying to say, hey, go out there and act like you're me. And then when you win, or if you win, I'll get the glory for it. And that, that's, that's the picture of the world. And so, but David knew because David is a type of Christ in the story. And remember the seed of uh, the woman, the incorruptible seed, the future king and savior of the world is in David physically. Okay, so watch how this plays out. He rejects the carnal weapons and the covering of the king, the earthly authority, uh, whose position he's destined to take, uh, and that in one day the king would even bow down to him. Uh, and he goes out and he fights the giant on the at the brazen altar or at the cross. Step one. Remember, this is Passover. Passover. Um, so he defeats the giant with spiritual weapons. He uses a rock, the Word of God. And that's what my message is basically all about. This, folks, is about the Word of God. I know it looks complicated, but it's really as simple as one, two, three. That's as simple as it is. A, B, C, one, two, three. A little, a lot, and all. All your strength, all your mind, and all your heart. Seek me with all your strength, all your mind, and all your heart. And that's where you'll find me. That's where we will meet. Uh, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind and prove the good and perfect will of God. Um, so David uh, battled with Goliath with a rock and a sling in the covenant with God. He called it first. He said, I'm going to take off your head this day. And he did. And the Philistines wound up scattering when Goliath was taken down with a rock. His head was crushed. And then his head was removed with his own sword, which, by the way, is a type of the two-edged sword of God. The devil wields the word of God, folks. That's what the devil uses against you. This deception in the last days, this perversion of the word of God, this legalism that people are putting on you and trying to drag you back under, this roots movement that's trying to put you under law, this, uh, this uh, Sabbath movement, Sabbath keepers movement, that's trying to put you under the Mosaic law, that's trying to drag you backwards instead of forwards. Uh, this, these are the things that are deceptions. They're part truth and part lie. They're mixture 
mixing the grace with the law, mixing the new covenant and the old covenant together, mixing the spirit and the flesh together, mixing grace and works together. This is corrupt and God hates it. I'm telling you, God hates it. It makes him sick to his stomach and he will vomit it out because why? God is pure. God is dividing and separating always from the beginning to the end. First, it's light from darkness. Then it's day from night. Then it's uh, land from the water. Then it's Noah from the, the, the whole Adamic race. Then it's Abraham from his family and his relatives and his land. I'll show you another good one here. Jesus on the hill. There's two crosses here. And what's in the middle? This two-edged sword that is the word of God, that is Jesus. There's a thief here and a thief here. Well, they're both bad. There's no, Neither one of them is good. There's none righteous. No, not one, except for the Lamb of God. Uh, but it divides between this uh, sinner and this sinner. Well, wh what's the difference? Well, this one fell on the rock and asked for mercy. He asked simply to be remembered. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had faith. He just had faith that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was bringing his own heavenly kingdom into the earth. He saw that much and he said, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you'll be with me today in paradise because of that little bit of faith. You know, Jesus is not looking for a way to disqualify you. Uh, by the law. Jesus is not looking for an excuse to criticize and judge you, looking for a flaw. Jesus is looking for an, a mustard seed size of faith in you, just simply for you to believe, enough for you to get you into the outer court, enough for to get you in the house before the Passover judgment in Egypt comes, before that final plague, to get you into the house, just to get you to get to the cross and cling to that cross, just to get you to ask him to remember you when he comes into his kingdom. And this other thief here, uh, who doesn't believe, but still continues to mock and scoff and say, if you're really that guy, then save yourself, and then I'll believe. But until I see you get down from the cross, I'm not going to believe. So he rejected Jesus. He went down. This guy went up, and this guy went down. You see the word of God dividing? God doesn't want mixture. God does not want you halfway in and halfway out. He doesn't want you to be keeping the law one day and living on grace the next. He doesn't want you to come to him with a whole explanation of why you deserve to enter into his kingdom, how good you are, and how much grace you need to add to that. Uh, he knows that you're a sinner, and even one sin will disqualify you. So just like the two thieves, we only have one way in, and it's to fall on the rock and be broken. Otherwise, if you stand in your pride, like at the end time, when Jesus says, I will be separating the wheat from the tares in the harvest of souls, that some that bow down will be gathered up. All those that bow down will be gathered up and taken into the barn and prepared for the kingdom. And all those that stand up in their pride, like Pharaoh and his kingdom, uh, even though they saw the works in the hand of God, they didn't bow. Those tares will be caught up and separated and bundled up and cast into the lake of fire over here with Lucifer and his angels. Um, so David, in this anointing, has a chance to take on the form of godliness, but he, but he uh, rejects that. And he continues in the faith. Um, then he goes into the wilderness because the king tries to kill him. So he goes into the wilderness, and there he actually dwells with the Philistines for a while. And he has an opportunity to, to kill the king, but he doesn't. He lets God uh, make a way for him. He doesn't promote himself, even though he knows that he is anointed to be the king. He, he, there's a timing. There's a direction to this. There's a three-step process to this happening. And I'm telling you, I don't care who you are or what anointing you think you have, Unless you go through this process from body to soul to spirit, from presenting your body a living sacrifice to being fully transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the washing of the water and the word, it doesn't, it's, you're going to see signs and wonders and miracles and things along the way. Believe me, the Hebrews in the wilderness saw miracles. They saw signs. They saw wonders. But many of them died in the wilderness and never saw the promised land. Uh, that's, that's because it doesn't happen because of signs and wonders. It happens because of the manna and the washing of the water of the word, because that's what transforms your mind. That's what puts off the old mind and puts on the new. Now, in the wilderness, uh, let's add one more thing here. When Moses went up onto the mountain, you'll remember he was on for 40 days, and he told the people waiting down below to wait there and to continue to pray and watch, and he would return. And he went up to uh, commune with God. Well, that's a picture of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. We've seen the first coming and all that it brought. It brought Passover and it brought them out to this point. Well, then Jesus left, right? Then, then Moses went up on the mountain and told them to wait. Now, this is where we're at today. Uh, we're, uh, we're out there in the wilderness right now waiting for Jesus to return from the mountain, from heaven. And what happened? The majority of people, the many that were waiting and camping around that mountain, got tired of waiting. They grew impatient. So what did they do? They were in darkness. Everything happens in darkness because it symbolizes the gross darkness just like the times of Noah, when the, the times of evil, violence, and corruption. The Bible says, so will it be in the end times, just like the times of Lot. 
when the when the sodomites came pounding on Lot's door. That was at nighttime, just like the virgins, the wise and the foolish, waiting for the return of the bridegroom. That was at nighttime, uh, just like the, the the Passover when Jesus was on the cross. It was noon, but in spiritual realm, it was a time of great spiritual darkness, uh, the most darkness that ever happened on the earth. In fact, it was so dark at that moment in time uh, that even the dead could not be held. There's many dead people that they say that rose from the dead uh, when that hour of darkness came on the earth. There was people that were sick that were healed. There was people that were possessed that were spontaneously deliberately delivered. Why did all that happen while Jesus was on the cross? Was it because he was atoning and paying the price? I believe it was because all the demons of all the world, the spiritual realm, all of Satan's kingdom was called. He whistled, he called, he blew his own trumpet, whatever, and he called all of his demons. Drop whatever you're doing. I don't care what you're in the middle of. If you're in the middle of killing someone, if you're in the middle of corrupting something, if you're in the middle of causing some corruption or perversion, uh, drop it and leave it come. This is an all-out emergency. It is the highest level of emergency uh, to our kingdom that can be. The, I found the seed, and here he's here now, and it's this is the hour. Come now immediately. And I believe that that delivered people from the grave, people from sickness, people from uh, possession, people from addictions, all kinds of things. People were delivered in that spiritual hour of darkness. That was a taste of what Pentecost does. You see, Pentecost in Egypt set the Hebrews free in their houses. They were spontaneously set free. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were thrown into the fiery furnace, heated up seven times hotter, which is a type of the seven-year tribulation period. It was heated up seven times hotter, in, in, indicating the time of ultimate judgment on the earth. They are a type of the overcomer, three of them, who went into the fiery furnace, also a type of Jesus, or a type of the bush that Moses saw on the, on the mountainside that was consumed in fire, but didn't burn up. These three Hebrew boys went into the furnace as overcomers, and they, they were there, and suddenly a fourth man appeared. The presence of God appeared. They met God there, the Shekinah light. They were in the Holy of Holies in that fiery furnace, and they were not, they were not burned up. But what did burn was their bonds, their ropes on their hands and on their feet, burned up instantly, but they themselves were unscathed, unmarred, not even smoke in their hair or on their clothes. And they came out of that fiery furnace, not only uh, delivered, but they came out glorified and they were elevated to the highest positions in the land. And all the people of the land bowed down and the people of the land turned away from their idols and turned to them, even the king. This is a picture of the resurrection, friends. This is a picture of Jesus who, uh, who died and was found innocent. Let's go back to the, the mountain and the people waiting. This is another picture of the end times. When the uh, children of Israel were camping around the mountain, uh, waiting for this 40-day period, extended period of time, that I believe that's a picture of the church age or this parenthesis in the history of Israel. Let me show you that real quick and then we'll get back to the mountain. On this timeline, we have the, the entire Adamic race. Then we have the second age. This is the first age, if you will. <clears throat> and in this age, God separated, uh, notice the, the flesh or the animals, that are called, uh, representing the flesh of men. The Adamic race was cut off. Uh, in this age, we have the, the new beginning with Noah in a new world that's washed clean by baptism. And we have the same pattern repeating over. Uh, they began to fill the earth. Well, in the midst of that, God calls Abraham and sets and separates him. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, 12 sons, the tribe, the nation. We have uh, all of the heroes, uh, David, uh, Samson, and all of his exploits. We have... Uh, as Queen Esther. We have all of these Bible stories, the whole Old Covenant. We have the wilderness journey and this tabernacle, this way that God gave them. We have the, the mountaintop that we're talking about now in the wilderness with the tablets of the law. That, um, and then at the end of that age, that part of the age, God divides, God separates in the midst of that between the Old Covenant that he made and the New Covenant that he makes with the Gentiles. This is Israel, or as I put down here before, the law, and this is the Gentiles or the church, and the age of grace. And this is like a pause. This is where the Gentiles are grafted in. This is where Israel is cut off at the cross, and the Gentiles are now grafted into the vine. Uh, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. But if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be cut off. Israel was cut off, and the Gentile age began. But the Bible tells us that there is going to be a separating in this age between the wheat that bows down and the tares that stand up between the sheep that are his and the goats that grow up amongst the sheep. And then at the at the end, this this group is going to be translated. Remember, we're transferred in this first stage. Then we're transformed in this wilderness stage from law to grace. We put off the law and put on the mind of grace. That's what this age is all about. Everyone that came out of Egypt and, and into the promised land died and was cut off. And everybody that was born in this land uh, grew up and they're the ones that went forward. So this is the this is the separation here between 
the law and grace, the old covenant and the new, those that had their eyes backwards and those that were looking forwards. But this is just a parenthesis. This Gentile church is going to be raptured or translated prior to the tribulation period. Well, how do I know that? Because this period here, when Jesus came to the earth, when the seed was born into the world and lived for 33 years, this is a picture of when Joseph came to his brothers the first time, and he came to them with bread and a message from the Father. Well, they rejected him, just like Israel rejected Jesus after 33 years. You see it? And then they rejected him. Their branch was cut off. Everything was destroyed, leveled, raised, and the people were taken into captivity and dispersed in the world. And they've been in captivity, listen, for 2,000 years or two days. You see that? The last days, the end times. But in 1948, almost like one generation before the end of this last two days, uh, Israel came back. They're called back to the nation from the world, and God gave them their land back in a miraculous way. But they're not fully blessed yet. You see, they're still under the judgment. They're still in a battle to even survive. But the church at, at some point is going to be caught up and taken away into heaven, and God uh, is going to come back. Uh, that's going to be the beginning of the tribulation. At that point, there will be no restraint in the world, no resistance to the Antichrist being revealed with all of his massive deception, the culmination of this deception that's already working and beginning in the earth, but's being held down by the salt and the light of the world. The word of God in the church is still resisting the full manifestation and the full takeover uh, of the world by the Antichrist. But at the, at the rapture, that resistance will be removed, and the Antichrist will then be revealed on the earth. He'll set up and establish his kingdom. Uh, but then when, at the, in the midst of that tribulation period, he'll enter into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and sit on the mercy seat and declare that he himself is God. He'll perform signs and wonders and miracles, even being killed and resurrected from the dead in front of everybody. Many things will happen. There will be two witnesses at the beginning of this period, two men that will arrive on the scene. There will be 144,000 that will be sealed in their forehead as being the, the sons of God, those, the first fruits, 12,000 from each tribe, if you will, um, that will um, not surrender, that will not give in. There will be the witnesses of God to Israel. Because just like when, when during this time here, when Jesus came for 33 years, he didn't come for the world or the, or the Gentiles. He came for the lost sheep of Israel only. He says in the, in the uh, Gospels, he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, listen, when he was there one day with his disciples teaching, uh, there was a woman that came to him and started yelling, you know, Master, Master, help, help. My daughter is sorely vexed by a demon, an evil demon, a powerful demon. Please have mercy, have mercy, Lord. And uh, because she was a Gentile, the disciples brushed her off. She's unclean. She's a cow outcast. She's not of Israel. We're, this is our Lord. This is our plan. This is the law. We have, we're the arbiters of the law. We're the, we're the ones and uh, Jesus, in fact, confirmed that when he said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? Uh, you tell me, is it right that I give the children's bread to the dogs? I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman says something amazing, incredible. Uh, she says, yes, Lord, I agree with you, but aren't the dogs allowed to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table or pushed off, dropped off, brushed off the leftovers? Don't the dogs get the scraps? And he shook his head. I'm sure I could see him smiling inside, beaming. Uh, because he said, woman, I haven't seen this great of faith in all of Israel. Here's a Gentile woman who came to him with great faith, realizing the law of gleaning from the back, from the days of Leviticus, way back in the beginning. The law of gleaning, where the harvesters are going through the field, are compelled by law not to uh, harvest the edges of the field, not to harvest the corners, and to leave the, the crops on the vine that are left over after the first pass, to not go back and glean themselves, but to leave those gleanings on the vines for the poor and the outcasts and the foreigners who have no other way to uh, survive. And, and also, they're, they're told that anything that drops on the ground, that falls off the master's table onto the floor, is to be left. That is a law. So she was actually saved by law, uh, grace, in, built into the law. Just like Jesus, that incorruptible seed that we saw, was built into the plan such that the devil was able to corrupt all of mankind down to the final seed, down to one last seed. Let all men be false, but let God be true. Let that one seed be incorruptible. Let that one seed be perfect. Remember the story of Sodom where the angels came to Abraham and they told him they were going to the city and they were going to destroy the city at the command of God because of the corruption. It was a stench and it was reaching all the way up to heaven. It was so vile, so evil. And much like the times of uh, the flood in Noah's day, we see Sodom with a judgment of fire, uh, extreme judgment, that such that no flesh would survive if God didn't intervene for the sake of the elect. Uh, that's a picture of this Tribulation, this baptism of fire, if you will, of the whole earth, the fire baptism, baptism of water, baptism of fire. Um, that It's a picture of that when uh, we see that Lot was saved 
during the nighttime in that period that he was saved, even though it was through fire, and he lost, even though he lost everything, he was still saved. He was taken out just before the, the judgment came. And interesting that the angels told uh, Abraham that um, they were going to go to the city and they were going to destroy the city because of the corruption. And I believe this was put in the scripture for our benefit, for your benefit, for my benefit, upon whom the ends of the age have come. We are here, folks. We are right here. And there's very little, if anything, that still needs to happen before we're taken out. And God once again begins to deal with Israel. Now listen, this is a seven, I'm going to forget where I was with Lot, but this is a seven-year period. He's going to work again for seven years for the hand of Israel. This is a this is pictured back in the story of Jacob, when he worked for Laban, do you remember this contract? Basically, I'll work for your daughter, for Rachel, for seven years, and then uh, I'll, you'll give me to give her to me in marriage. Well, at the end of the seven years, then Laban revealed to him that the law had to be fulfilled first before he could get this grace, before he could marry his his uh, first love. So he had to marry Leah first. So they put he put they put Leah in the wedding tent. Then he woke up in the morning, married to Leah, type of the church, instead of Rachel, a type of Israel. You see how the church was saved in the story by the law, but in reality, God reversed it to hide it there so that it became a mystery hidden like an Easter egg for us to dig out that the law really represents grace and the grace which went to Israel is really represents the law. You see how God flipped it on us so that we wouldn't or they wouldn't be able to see the story that uh, they would still be blinded. Uh, and, he, and he says as much in the scripture. This is why he taught in parables, so that those that did not see uh, would, would not see the truth and repent. Why? Because this way, he, his plan to get both the Gentiles and Israel saved, the, the church and Israel, that would become one out of this battle. So uh, we're at this point right here uh, where... There's almost nothing that has to be fulfilled before we enter into the seven-year tribulation. Jesus worked 33 years, remember, before the cross for Israel, and he's coming back again at this point to call his bride his church, but he's going to work again the time of Jacob's trouble, where Jacob had to work seven more years before Laban in order to gain the hand of Rachel, but it seemed to him but a moment, okay? So Jesus is going to fulfill that right here, seven more years for Israel. You put the 33 and the seven together and you come up with 40 years. With this church age or the time of the Gentiles, this two days or 2,000 year period in between splitting mysteriously, tucked in, grafted into the middle of the history that is Israel's. Um, it's, it's an amazing miracle. So this is where we are, about to be raptured, about to be caught up, and about to transfer in. And this timeline this timeline, this pattern of three steps, seven stages and uh, three steps along the way uh, is the pattern of the Exodus. It's a pattern of David's three anointing. You know, there was three kings in Israel, Saul, David, and Solomon. I've given you a lot. I could go on for hours longer and just keep going. I literally have hundreds of these patterns for you that I could show you. The kingdom of God is like a, the, or a corn that falls into the ground and comes up. First the blade, then the ear, then the mature head in the ear. Uh, Solomon tells his son to get knowledge, carnal knowledge. And with your knowledge, get understanding. Well, what is the understanding if it isn't renewing of the mind? And then with that, finally, he says, add to that wisdom. So we go from knowledge to understanding to wisdom. And we know that we only get wisdom, as it says in the book of James, by asking for it. Any man that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and upbraideth not. Uh, we go from faith to hope to love. Uh, this pattern is throughout the Bible, from the beginning, from the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, uh, from the Garden of Eden, all the way through every story of the Bible, all the way to the end. It even is the Adamic race, representing the outer court, the flood of Noah, representing the first veil, the entire human uh, history from the flood all the way to the tribulation period, divided in the center of all human race by the cross and by Jesus, who divides not only the, not only the two thieves, but he divides though between the law and grace. He divides between the old covenant and the new covenant. He divides between the flesh and the spirit. Um, and it divides between the beginning and the end, or the, the first Adam and the new Adam, or the, the old and the new kingdom. Uh, it's, it's the beginning. But this whole period represents the transformation where we're putting off the old and putting on the new, uh, where Israel fell away, and then the new Israel, born in the wilderness, uh, went forward. And then this is the tribulation is literally the second veil of the tabernacle. They're transferred here, transformed here from law to grace, from the old ways and looking back to grace the new way and looking forward. 
uh, going through the tribulation period or the veil, and only, listen, this is very important, only the elect go through the veil. Remember, many are called, a few are chosen, one is elect. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that it's just about a group of people that are the called, and another group of people, and they're a little better than them, and they're called the chosen, and then out of that, there's some that are even the best, and they're called the elect. No, this is all applied in three different levels, in three different ways. Now, now watch what I'm going to tell you. It applies historically. This is this is the history of the world. The outer court, the inner court, the Holy of Holies with the two veils, right? Uh, this was the flesh that was sacrificed. This is the division or the transformation stage. And this is the rest the coming into his presence. The many are called, the few are chosen. The one is elect. This applies historically. This applies present day. And it also applies prophetically into the future of what's actually going to happen in the kingdom. Uh, we're going to come to this mercy seat and we're going to come to the Ark of the Covenant in which dwells the three things, the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. Remember the, the jar of manna that we're going to be allowed, the overcomers are going to be allowed to eat from, uh, and the Aaron's rod that budded leaves, flowers, and almonds. Remember the leaves, the flowers, and the almonds? The fullness, the life of the Spirit, the 30, 60, 100, the called, the chosen, the elect. And they overcame, and look in the, the book of Revelation, uh, this fruit, this manna that they're going to get to eat from, this new name that they're going to get. How do you get a new name if it's not through marriage? You obtain the name of your husband. Uh, Women, well, you know that. Uh, they're going to get the new name, the overcomers. Uh, they're going to be the bride of Christ. They're going to become pillars in the kingdom, meaning they're going to be raised up to authority. Well, how, who's going to get that? And how are you going to get that? By overcoming. Well, what does overcoming mean? Does that mean you saw a lot of signs and wonders and miracles? Does that mean you gave a lot of money in church? Does that mean you were a faithful tither? Does that mean you kept the Sabbath every day of your life from the first time you knew about it until the end? No, it doesn't mean any of that. It means you overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony, and by not loving your life even unto death. Let me give you a couple of examples of that and show you how this pattern applies. Peter and the disciples were with Jesus one day, and they uh, were on the seashore teaching the people. Jesus was teaching. The disciples were there watching. They were feeding 5,000 people. They didn't have enough, so they uh, they looked around. The disciples' solution was to send the people home. That's the carnal mind, uh, using the weapons of the, the carnal flesh. Oh, let's just send them home. That's easy. We don't have anything for them. Jesus says, that's ridiculous. You guys have been with me long enough. You should know uh, who I am and what I can do. So they went out, and they found a little boy in the crowd of 5,000 that had his little hobo sack, and they had a little handkerchief with some pieces of fish and a couple pieces of bread in there, just a little sack lunch. 5,000 people in one little lunch. Isn't that the odds, like Gideon with his 300 against 135,000 Midianites? Here we've got, uh, or David against Goliath, or Samson against 1,000 Philistines, on and on and on, every story of the Bible tells us. Or Jesus, alone and naked, with no carnal weapons, not a, not, a, not a word from his mouth, not a cry or a whimper, not one cry, not one call out to the angels. He didn't give a trumpet blast to sound the alarm to call his uh, troops. No, without any weapons at all. He defeated the whole entire kingdom of darkness in silence, and simply by taking the judgment that he, that he didn't deserve, by becoming the scapegoat, by becoming the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, he defeated the enemies. Uh, here we have in this other story, uh, Jesus with his disciples and 5,000 hungry souls. That's just the men. Maybe there was 10,000 counting the women and the children or more. And they have one little tiny bag of food. What are the odds? Okay, but yet they, in faith, they bring that to Jesus and say, here, Lord, this is what we have. What can you do with this? Right? Um, like Moses, who brought his rod up the hill to God. And, and he, he says, you're going to send me back to Egypt after all that? I've been out here with the Gentile, and i got a Gentile bride now, and I'm going to have to return for seven more years. I'm going to have to return and perform a bunch of plagues and confront Pharaoh. I already have a death sentence. They killed me the last time I was there, right? You want me to go back again? And he's got all he's got is his little shepherd staff. Well, God tells him, you know, give me that shepherd staff. And I'm not mocking Jesus. I'm having fun right now. Uh, I hope you are too. Um, so he, he gives him his shepherd's staff. He says, now throw it on the ground. And he does. And it turns into a, a venomous snake. He says, grab it by the tail. Noah, or Moses actually turned around and ran away because he saw the snake. <laughs> but he comes back. Thank God he came back. And he grabs it by the tail. And it turns back into a rod. Well, with that one rod, he did miracles. And with that one rod, not only did he set the people free, the entire nation of Israel, he destroyed the kingdom of darkness. And he also opened up and parted the Red Sea. And he led them into the wilderness. And he went up and he obtained the law from God. And he brought it back, and he brought judgment and righteousness, and he even showed mercy by being the intercessor and standing between God's law and uh, sinful man. Uh, so anyway, I, want, I forgot. I, want, I left us hanging there with the mountain, and these people that went around the mountain and were coming out. I think I should go back and finish that story. Then we'll get to the 5,000. Uh, the people going around the mountain, the Hebrews, when they came out, uh, they traveled around and they camped. But they got tired one day uh, waiting for the second coming, waiting for Moses to come back down the mountain. So what did they do? In their minds, they went back to Egypt. They turned around, just like Lot's wife in the wilderness. They turned around and they looked back to the ways of the world. 
and they took all their gold and silver that they plundered from the world, and guess what they did with it? They tithed. They put it into the hands of the priest. They asked him to make for them a god. They wanted something bigger in return for their tithe. They wanted a hundredfold return. We're going to give you some gold that we got from the world, and we want you to make for us a god out of that gold. Give us a god that we can worship that will give us joy and uh, pleasure and power and all these other things in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the night. So that's what they did. They, they gave him that, and they created this golden calf, this idol that they worship, and they put it in the middle of their camp on their fake altar. And who are they? They represent Pentecost, friends, Passover, Pentecost. They represent where the church is at today with its false idolatry going on in the churches, the so-called churches, with these uh, this fire, this fake fire that they're stirring up with drums and musical instruments and uh, hyperventilating and dancing around, like uh, trying to act like David when he was bringing back the Ark of the Covenant uh, from the Philistines. People that return of the Ark of the Covenant happened in David's third anointing. It wasn't in Pentecost. It was in David, under David's third anointing when he was anointed by the entire nation, when he was an overcomer, loving not his life even death, unto death, when he was willing to walk, prance around as the king with his robes off and just a, a towel wrapped around him in the middle of the streets in front of everybody to be humiliated, to fall on the rock and humble himself in the presence of God, bringing the ark back from captivity to the, to the Philistines. If you remember the story, if you don't, go back and read it or listen to it. It's a, it's a powerful story of the end times and of our Lord Jesus. And that story, when David was dancing like that, he was already an overcomer, willing to have nothing, willing to lay down his life and even to lose his wife, Michael, who laughed at him, who mocked him and at the time uh, because of the way he looked, because of the embarrassment that he brought, because of the humiliation and the shame that he bore on the cross. She rejected because she didn't want to participate in his death. Uh, therefore, she didn't participate in the resurrection and the life. You see that? That's what David did. He participated in that loss. And he, he, he as a type of Christ, danced like a crazy man and, and showed himself uh, uncovered. He, he had no pride. He did not go in his kingly anointing and his kingly prides, acting like a hero, uh, wanting to be a hero. He was still like that little shepherd boy, willing to go out there in his sandals and his little uh, tunic or whatever with a rock and a sling and face down the biggest giant that these people had ever seen alone. And even though the people mocked him, even his brothers mocked him and rejected him, even the king mocked him and laughed at him. Uh, but anyway, um, David brought back the ark during that third anointing, when he was anointed to be the king. And believe me, uh, what that is a picture of, uh, this period right here, where the ark that was lost at the cross, Jesus is the ark at the cross. Israel lost the ark to the Gentiles. The Gentiles, or the, the Philistines, I should say, to whom the ark was lost during that story, is a picture of the Gentiles, or the church age, the time of the Gentiles, where the ark was actually in the house of the Gentiles for a period of time. That is a picture of this age of Pentecost, Okay, and that's a picture of the Gentiles trying to bring the ark into their uh, the houses of Dagon, their earthly gods, their earthly things, trying to mix Christianity and earthly things or legalism. And the, the, what happened was uh, the presence of God destroyed, rather than helping their system, uh, their churches grow, it actually destroyed. And their idols at the end of the day fell over and their neck and their arms were broken off. And that's about what's going to happen to all these fake churches that are, that are having fake services and hyping up God during this time of transformation. They're putting on uh, a, a, a false idols. They're putting out their uh, golden calves that they're creating with their fancy, and I'm going to grab the third rail here. And I know this is going to offend many, many people, but I want to tell you the truth, lest I be responsible for not telling you the truth. Uh, I'm going to tell you that there, that these uh, prophecies of uh, prosperity, these uh, holy services of glory and fire and more fire. People, if the presence of God came and found you right now or me in the state that we're in before we're translated, before we've become the elect, before, while we still have an ounce of the love of this world in us, where we're not fully overcomers yet, if the presence of God comes and finds you in that state, if the glory of God came, you would not be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that went into the fiery furnace, were cast into the fiery furnace, uh, and came out unscathed. But you and I would be like the high priest Uzzah who touched the ark while it was still on an ox cart and didn't realize he had to use or remember that he had to use the wooden poles which represent the cross and the ark is Jesus on the cross. We come to Jesus through his humanity. So we come to God the Father, I should say, through the Son, through the humanity of Jesus, through the wooden cross, through the wooden posts 
uh, that carry it, through the wooden poles that carry the brazen altar. We do not come directly to God. We're not that good. We're not that righteous. Anybody that comes in their own name, in their own righteousness, with their own amount of glory, or thinks that in any way, shape, or form they are, or even are going to become someday a God, is completely deceived and deluded. That's never going to happen. We're going to be with God, and we are going to be like Him, but we're not going to be God. Trust me, that, that is a heresy that will get you a one-way ticket out. Uh, you'll be like the, the, uh, the man that came to the wedding feast in your own garment. I don't care how righteous it is. You know, there's ten virgins in the story all waiting for the bridegroom, and half of them are foolish. Well, they're virgins, folks. They're pure. They're holy. Aren't they good? Well, why does God uh, judge them? Well, because they came in their own righteousness. The, the wise ones and the foolish ones, they all had their own measure of righteousness. But that's not enough. You're not going to be married to the God because you're, of your own righteousness. You're going to come in the garment that he provides. You're going to come in the wedding garment, or you're going to get that one-way ticket out. You're going to be rejected. You're going to come be, you're going to find out at the end that too late that you don't have what it takes, that you don't have the double portion. Why don't you have it? Because you didn't overcome. The double portion only goes to the overcomer who loves not his life even unto death. And folks, let's take this back to uh, the story of Peter and the disciples with Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we'll end it with this, uh, even though this is far from the end. And I hope this picture, this uh, teaching has given you at least an inkling of an idea of what this three-step pattern is, of how powerful it is from beginning, uh, the, the Son, Spirit, and Father, the outer court, inner court, Holy of Holies, the body, the soul, the spirit, seeking with all your strength, all your mind, all your heart, overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, and not loving your life, even unto death, from Egypt to the wilderness, to the promised land, from the outer court to the inner court, to the Holy of Holies. I could go on and on. The raven or the dove going once, going twice, going three times. Uh, just every story. The, it, uh, believe me, uh, uh, the, the prophet Elijah, Elijah took Elijah from, uh, I believe it was from uh, Bethel, or Bethel, I believe, is where they started on the journey, the final journey. And they went to three stages of the journey. Three stages. I think it was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up on the names, but I'm going to try. Bethel to Gilgal, from Gilgal to Jericho, from Jericho to Jordan. And it was in the Jordan that he was raptured. Now watch, uh, at all three stages, the prophet Elijah told Elisha to basically stay here. I'm going forward, but you stay. It was a test to see if he would overcome by the first. He said, stay here, I'm going on. Elisha said, no, I'm going to follow you, master. So they went to the next city, and he, and he said, stay here, and he starts giving him more information to renew his mind, and he explains to him why he should stay and not go. But he insists even more, I'm going to go. I'm not going to stay here, I'm going to go. And, and so he gets past this one, and he gets to the third uh, place, and he finally says, what do you want from me? Basically, as an overcomer, as an overcomer, you get to ask what you want. But by there, you've gotten rid of your mind, and you have the mind of Christ, and you're not going to ask for any foolish thing, like a new boat, a new house, a, a brand new shiny car, a, a bank account full of gold, and a, a whole bunch of Bitcoin in your, in your wallet. You're going to ask for things of God. You're going to not store up your treasures on earth anymore. You're going to store up your treasures in heaven. Hopefully, by that time, uh, you realize that the mind of man is going to turn you into a pillar of salt, or get you to dying in the wilderness, so you'll be sent back and not go forward, or get you kicked out of the wedding feast. Um, but in that stage, uh, they, they uh, were at the third city, Elijah and Elisha, and Elijah asked Elisha, what do you want? Um, he said, I want a double portion of your anointing, okay? And, and forget what you've learned about anointing. It's not what you think it is. Many of you, I'm not saying everybody, but what a lot of us were taught for a long time, anointing is not that, okay? David's anointings were that one day he would be become the king, but it didn't mean that he had... Uh, everything right away. He had to go through all these journeys, and uh, each one led him to the next, just like Elisha here. So I want a double portion of your anointing, okay? And, he, and Elijah it gave us an insight. He said, if you see me when I'm taken up. In other words, if you love not your life, even unto death, and you're willing to go into this place as the high priest, if you're willing to go this far all the way to the Jordan, all the way to this place, and you see the chariots of fire or the Shekinah light, if you follow me that far, Remember, all the other prophets stood afar off on the other bank on the other side of the river and watched the catching up. Uh, but, but he said, if you see me, then you'll get your, your way. The overcomers, get those things, folks. That's it. It's for the elect. Not the called, not the chosen, but the elect. This is 30, 60, this is 100. Listen, this is leaves and flowers. There's no fruit there. It may look good, it may smell good, but it, you can't eat it. It's not fruit. Uh, leaves, flowers, almonds. Leaves, flowers, almonds. Carnal, soul, spirit. Uh, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's a fact. Uh, so this picture is for each of us to seek him with all our strength, all our mind, and all of our heart. All of our outer court, all of our inner court, all of our holy holies, and all that those stages mean. Being transferred, being transformed, being translated. And 
Uh, to whom little is given, little is required. But to whom much is given, much will be required. Okay, so what happened with Elijah and Elisha is that Elisha followed, and he did see Elijah being caught up in the chariot. He saw the translation, or the ascension, or the rapture of his Lord, of Jesus. Okay, and he saw him go up. Now, it's very interesting that the angels, when Jesus was caught up into the heavens and raptured up, the angel of the Lord said, the same way that you saw him go, he will come again. He will come again. You will see him come the same way that he left. Now, during this tribulation period, I alluded to it earlier, but I, I left it there. Now I'm going to finish it. There are two witnesses that come and witness to Israel. They're on, I believe, TV because it says that every eye will see them. They're on YouTube. They're on TV. They're everywhere because they're amazing. They're, 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 uh, they're gone viral. Okay. They're, everybody's watching because these men can't be killed and their testimony is powerful. And they're doing miracles and signs and wonders. And for a period of time, they cannot be killed. These two men, these two witnesses that are testifying to the glory of God on the whole earth. And this is, I believe, how Israel gets saved. The 144,000 that are sealed by the Spirit of God and the two witnesses that are there. Well, who are those two witnesses if it isn't two men in the Old Testament that never died? One of them is our man here, Elijah, who was caught up alive in heaven. The other one, I'm convinced, is Enoch, who, who was raptured during this age. Elijah was raptured during this age. And Jesus was raptured in this age. Do you see the three? And I believe all three of them are going to return. First, Elijah and Enoch are going to return as witnesses, right? And they will die because the Bible says it's appointed unto every man once to die, and after that, the judgment. So these two men that never did die have to die. So this is what he's saving them for, is this. They're going to return as these two witnesses, and then in the midst of that time, they're going to die. They're going to be dead for three days, lying in the street. Nobody will dare to touch them, their bodies. But then they'll be resurrected just right in front of everybody, shockingly, a, a, a vivid uh, evidence that the resurrection is real, that, the, that Jesus indeed lived and died and raised from the dead three days later. They've witnessed it with their own eyes now. And then Jesus is going to return after that um, and then establish his kingdom on the earth. So let's go back one more story and then we're done. Uh, Jesus, Peter, and the, the disciples and the 5,000, um, they, they give this bread to him and the, Jesus breaks the bread and the fish and he starts handing it out to them. And we're seeing the kingdom in action here, which is what everything Jesus did during his life was evidence of the kingdom of God operating in front of them. Uh, from the parables to the miracles, it was all revealing that he has authority as the king and his kingdom, his heavenly kingdom that is invading the kingdom of darkness. He came as one man, like David came as one boy to defeat Goliath and the entire Philistine army. Jesus came as one man and just got a few followers to defeat the army of Satan and destroy the enemy to crush the, the, the serpent's head. And he, he is breaking this bread as a sign of the power of the kingdom to multiply instead of to reduce. Instead of in the kingdom of this world, you give it away and you have less. But in the kingdom of God, the more you give away, the more you have. So he's passing out the bread to his disciples who are then handing it to the people. Now listen, his disciples saw and knew what happened. The people did not. They didn't have food, but they don't know what happened. You understand what, what the difference from being here and being here. The people were here in this stage. They were in the outer court. They were being fed the bread and being blessed by it. The disciples were here. Their minds were being transformed because they were witnessing the kingdom happening. They, they knew the dilemma. They, they talked directly with the Lord here, and they saw the bread that was handed to him and the little pieces of fish, and they received it back from him. They handed it to him, they got it back, and then they went and passed it out. And they know that they kept going back, and they know that he just kept breaking it and it kept multiplying. They saw this, and they gave it to the people, and they were completely uh, messed up. They were completely uh, changed, altered. Because of this, just like every other miracle that Jesus did revealed the kingdom. Well, of course, they didn't know what all this meant. They didn't see it, what was coming, because their reference point was what had been. And all they had so far was the law. And they didn't understand how this eating on the Sabbath, which he did with his disciples, how not tithing, uh, necessarily just getting a fish from the, from the water and go ahead and give this to pay the taxes or something, how these kinds of things, how talking back and talking down to the Pharisees, how condemning the religious order, the, the order of the legalists, how all of that could be God. They didn't quite understand, but they couldn't deny that he had the words of life and not death. Uh, he had the words of liberty and he had the power and the obvious authority now to manifest it, to, to uh, display it, right? To the light, to shining in the darkness. And he made them want more of it. So they continued to follow. So anyway, the 5,000 are fed and the breaking stops. Well, then this is where it gets really interesting. 
Uh, that's a miracle. That's incredible. But it, there's even more that came out of it, much more than that. That's just a 30-fold carnal understanding. Wow, Jesus took a little and he made a lot. Wow, that's great. And we got to participate in that ministry. How wonderful is that? That's amazing. But watch what happens. The disciples went around after the people were satisfied. So everybody got their bellies filled. They got their daily bread. But afterwards, the disciples went around with the baskets that they had used to pass out the bread over and over. And they knew what was given to start. And at the end, they each gathered up the scraps, the crumbs that were left on the ground that were brushed off the table, the gleanings, right? The gleanings. And they each had a full basket. Yes, you see the picture of the parable, uh, give and it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. How does it grow in the kingdom? But it does. You put your money in the bank and it diminishes. Inflation eats it up. Uh, the tax man eats it up. Uh, high prices eat it up. It just get, it just disappears. But you invest in the kingdom of heaven. And I don't mean in necessarily into a prosperity teaching or things like that. I'm talking about literally feeding souls into the kingdom of heaven. You invest what you have, your time, your talents, your abilities, your skills into the kingdom of heaven, and it will grow. It will gain more than interest. It will multiply, press down, press down, shaken together, inexhaustible. So the disciples each now have a, an example of uh, what they could do, their authority, that they're going to do greater works than him. Now they can start with a full basket, their own ministry, after he leaves. Just like Elisha, that when Elijah was caught up, his mantle, his covering fell down, dropped down from heaven. That's a picture of Jesus resurrecting and then sending the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That mantle is a type of the anointing or the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's what Elijah was asking for. I want to be like you only twice as much. Jesus said, when I go, uh, you'll do greater works than me. And if you see me when I go, if you see the resurrection, if you see the ascension, if, you're, if you go that far, they get that deep, folks, get past the, the gathering up and collecting stuff on the earth of plundering Egypt, right? That's what they did when they were in Egypt. They plundered. They were set free, and then they plundered the riches of the world. They borrowed all they could, and now they're rich. The transference happened in Egypt, right? But what if they would have stayed in Egypt and tried to take over Egypt and establish God's kingdom and the Israel over the Egyptians and pull it all down. Can you see the ridiculousness of some of these false doctrines and false teachings that maybe some of you are caught up into thinking that somehow that you are going to take over all the dominions of the world, all the kingdoms of the world and make them into the kingdoms of God. And, and when you do all that, he's going to come back for this perfect bride that's made herself perfect and spotless and conquer the world for him. Do you see the silliness? That would be like the Hebrews staying in Egypt once they got salvation and thinking that somehow now they have the power and the ability because they've taken some of the world's riches that now they can buy land and conquer the world and take over all the kingdoms of the earth. Who wants the kingdom of the earth? God promised them a land of their own. He didn't promise them that they were going to live in this world forever and conquer it. There's religious orders, cults, that believe that somehow we're going to live on this earth forever and that this, this period of time lasts for eternity. There's other people that think that somehow they're going to get here and they're going to become gods and they're going to go out and have their own planet and they're going to start their own kingdom in their own world. They're going to be gods and rule and kind of repeat this whole thing in this endless cycle of gods and planets and saviors and uh, heavenly wives and heavenly children. And, and they're going to, but they're going to be in charge now and just kind of complete this thing perpetually. This is silliness. Um, th this is absurdity. This doesn't follow the pattern. You see, this pattern is like a, like a standard. It's like a plumb line. It's like a ruler. It's like a level. Uh, it's like a square. It, it measures. This is the truth. This is the order. Uh, this is the way that God has set up. This is the pattern in his law of the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to m the Father except through me. Uh, no man comes to me except the Father calls him. The many that are called, the many that are called to come to the ark, the many that are called to come into the outer court of the tabernacles, to come and taste and see that he's good. Um, so what did I leave out? Uh, oh, I was on the 5,000. So after they gather their baskets, this is where it gets really good. Jesus goes out into the uh, shore. Everybody, They sent everybody home except the disciples, and Jesus leaves, and he goes to the other side. It doesn't say how, but I, it's a picture of the of the ascension. He's gone. And he says, now you guys come over to the other side. So they're on the way. Okay, this happened on the shore. Uh, eat my flesh, right? Drink my blood, the Passover, the communion table. He said, eat my flesh. This is the cross. It happened. Now uh, Jesus is going over to the other side. He's taking off and he's saying, now you guys come through this uh, sea at night. Uh, get in your boat and roll across and I'll meet you on the other side, right? Uh, so they, they're in the middle of the sea and it's the middle of the night and all of a sudden a storm comes up. So they're in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the storm, but they're in their boat. 
and they've just come from this major experience, this miracle that they were a part of, that they witnessed Jesus perform. Sure, they were a part of it, but they really didn't have much to do with it. Uh, they were learning from it, just like Elijah was learning from Elijah. And when the mantle fell, he just put the mantle on, and then he took it out, and he opened the sea and did twice as many miracles as Elijah had done. He got the double, okay? And it's not just twice as many, it's greater, meaning that um, uh, your portion is earthly. Your inheritance is natural. It will run out. It will diminish. It will decrease. But his portion, the portion of the firstborn son, is the double portion. He gets the father's portion, right? Which is a symbol of the eternal portion, the part that doesn't run out. It's, it is incorruptible and uh, it will not run out. It's inexhaustible. So when you take your portion, it takes all of your portion, plus you add to that his inexhaustible portion. It doesn't matter how much you have. You will never get there on your own. But when you have his portion, you cannot lose. It, it will give you enough to overcome. Uh, this is what happened in the, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the storm, uh, in the middle of the sea. Uh, the storm came up, and they were rowing, they were working, they were using all their skill, their talent, their, their knowledge, their understanding, their ability, and they still weren't making enough headway. The boat was filling up. I could see them now beginning to panic, bailing, rowing, uh, sailing, doing everything they knew how to do and still failing. And they're all going to die out there, and they're in a panic. And isn't this what happens to us out here whenever we face something? And what are you going to do? Are you going to turn around and go back? They can't. There's no way back. They're going to die. Uh, can they go forward? They can't. They're trying as hard as they can. Their portion is running out. They're at the end of themselves, the end of their mind, their end of their ability. They've tried everything and failed, right? And this is how you overcome when you exhaust yourself, when you exhaust your seeing with all your strength and all your mind. And that's where they're at right now in the middle of the sea. Finally, Jesus shows up and, he, and they see him afar off, but they, they think he's a ghost or something. They don't know. But Peter says, at your word. Now, folks, this is what we need in this present age. This is where we're at right before, right before this second veil, this Jordan River, this tribulation period. We're right there. We're right in that boat with them. We've exhausted ourselves in the church, running around. I know I used to go to church three times, four times every Sunday. I'd go four or five nights a week. I was teaching. I was learning. I was ushering. I was traveling. I was ministering. I was being ministered to. I was prophesying my brains out. And it's, I mean, where, where did it get us? Yeah, we learned a little bit. A lot of people got a little blessing, but who knows what it got us. Uh, we're still here. Uh, so we, we need more. We need to go on. That's where we're at. All of our effort are exhausted. Are you ready to quit trying yet and just fall on the rock and let Jesus? Now watch. Are you ready to overcome? Here's, the, here's, here's where it is. The, the victory goes to the overcomers, uh, the elect, the called, the chosen, and the elect, overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, and not loving your life even unto death. They saw Jesus, and only one of them, only the elect, the high priest, the one that's elected out of the priesthood, that one part got out of the boat and said, Jesus, at your word, I'll come. And God, Jesus said, come. And he jumped out of the boat. He climbed over the side in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, and he left behind the boat, the oars, the friends, the land, the miracles, the life, Everything. He left it all behind for one thing, to just get to Jesus. He said, basically, not my will, but yours be done. Even if you kill me, yet will I praise you. I, like Abraham, and sacrificing, offering his son on the altar, uh, he said, even if he kills him, I know he can resurrect him. And that's what Peter did. He got out of the boat, and sure enough, he took two or three steps, and everybody faults Peter because he began to sink, saying, oh, look, he got his eyes off. Well, which one of you would have got out of the boat in the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the storm, and walked to Jesus on the water and when you're going across a, a, a sea? And, and you're, you're about to die anyway, but you see Jesus and you hear him talk to you and just say, come. Which one of you would have jumped out of the boat? And which one of you would have been able by faith to even take one step, much less two or three or however many Peter did on the water? Of course, he sank. He reached the end of himself. He sought him with all of his strength and then all of his mind. And he was ready to go. He was ready to go. He had just seen Jesus do a miracle that just floored him. He was so in love with Jesus and he was so tired and done with this life and exhausted from putting out all of his strength to try to save himself. He finally just said, God, if you're, if you're real, just call me and I'll come. And at your word, I'll come. And, and it is word. That's what we need, folks. We need to hear Jesus. We need to get into the word of God. We need this word. We don't need signs and wonders and miracles. They will follow you. You do not need to seek them. You don't follow after them. They will follow you if you follow this. They will be there when you get there. You don't need to plan them. You don't need to fake them. You don't need to chase them or follow them around. It says that mercy and joy or gladness will follow you. Uh, you just go the way God tells you. You follow God and those things will happen in your life. Um, so he, Jesus reaches out. He expended his portion and the double portion came to him. Jesus gave him his portion and the resurrected Jesus reached down, pulled him up out of the water. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they were both back in the boat with the disciples and they were both on the, all in the, on the other side raptured. Uh, Peter went as the high priest, if you will. 
into the presence of God, not loving his life even unto death. And I pray this, this word, this pattern, means something to you. And again, this is just a taste of this pattern, this key that unlocks the scriptures to you. This is the straight and narrow way. And the option is, this is the straight and narrow way to stay on this path, to follow the incorruptible seed, to keep your eyes on Jesus, the center point of all human history, from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden to the to the manna in the wilderness, the daily bread, to the, the, uh, the, the Lamb of God on the cross, eat my flesh, Jesus says, to the end, uh, where to the word of God that we have right now, that is our bread, our daily bread, and back here to the one that overcomes, gets to eat from the hidden manna, and in the kingdom we'll see the tree of life, which is Jesus. That tree of life will be here for the overcomers. It says that these days will be the worst in the history of the world. There's many people that think that in 70 AD, all of the prophecies of the Bible were fulfilled. The Bible says that of those times in the end, the tribulation, it will be the worst times in the history of the world. Nothing worse has ever happened, and nothing worse will ever happen again. This tribulation by fire is the presence of God on the earth. This is the glory that many people are crying out for in churches, foolishly, ignorantly, not understanding that that's the fiery furnace heated up seven times hotter. Our God is a consuming fire. If you dare to touch him, if you dare to enter into his presence, uh, I don't care how much you think you love God or want God to give you more of him. God says a severe warning to go to many of us uh, who, I, and believe me, I've sang those songs a thousand times myself uh, and cried tears, wanting more and more and more of God, more fire, more fire. I've cried that out. I know what it feels like. I know the thoughts. I know the feeling, but I'm going to tell you what God says. He, he said uh, in that day, in what day? In this day, many are going to come to him in the judgment at the end of this, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we heal the sick? Signs and wonders, folks. Raise the dead. How many of you have actually raised the dead? I'm sure there's a few of you that have seen it. Uh, I've seen things uh, like that. Um, uh, I haven't actually done it, but many are going to come and actually say, uh, didn't we heal the sick? Didn't we raise the dead? Didn't we do all manner of good works? And Lord, didn't we do those in your name? And you know what he's going to say? He says, but I'm going to tell them, go away, you workers of iniquity. You unrighteous, you, you, you who dare to come in here in your own righteousness, dressed in your own wedding garment, you who dare to come in here and tell me how good you are, you, use your own good works to try to get a pass, you who tried to circumvent the cross and get in here based on your own overcoming, your own ability, you who uh, did not come this straight and narrow way, he's going to say one scary thing, one of the most terrifying, severe warnings in the entire word of God, he's going to say, go away, listen, I never knew you, and here you are, wanting to know me. Now, that's a very subtle difference, but very, very important. It's not about you knowing him. It's about him knowing you. Have you gotten uncovered uh, spiritually before God? Have you uncovered your sins, your heart, your everything in you? Have you borne your soul to God like David did and just laid it all open? Have you gone out like Peter and given him your all, loving not your life even unto death? Um, if not, then you'll, you are in danger. I'm telling you right now, for the sake of the elect, these days will be cut short. Not for the sake of the called, not for the sake of the chosen, but for the sake of the elect, the overcomers, for the Peters who got out of the boat. Uh, now, I will say that Peter and Jesus got back into the boat and the twelve went over. Uh, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And who is the elect? And who is the first fruits? And who is the lamb? Who is the overcomer? Who is the prophet, the priest, and the king of kings, if it's not our Jesus? So, uh, folks, I hope this word was a blessing to you. I hope you understood it and got a lot out of it. I'm sorry for my terrible writing. There's a lot to a lot to say. I'll step out of your way here if you want to uh, see that a little bit clearer. Um, uh, please like and subscribe. It helps tremendously with getting the word out to other people. Um, uh, please share the video with someone that you think might enjoy this. Um, sorry that it was so long, but in reality, it's just a drop in the bucket. And what we need to learn is more patience to endure. Uh, it took 40 days for um, Moses to come back to the people. They lost their patience and missed the blessing. They got cursed instead. Uh, it's gonna. It's taken almost 2,000 years, and many are falling away now and getting into false religions and cults and uh, false glory, uh, thinking that they've got Jesus in their presence when, in fact, he hasn't returned. They've just got some fake thing that's been trumped up, made up by men, uh, some idols and some false forms of worship and so on. We better have humility. Remember, for all of you praisers and worshipers out there, worship is done to God, not to the people. We don't, when we lead people uh, in worship, we are going the direction. We should not have our face to the people. We should be turned uh, towards God and worshiping. And I'm not talking to everybody, but there's a few people out there, I'm sure, that are hearing this and are going to be convicted. Uh, that, that if you're uh, praising and worshiping and, and drawing attention to your own voice, your own instruments, your own talent, your own skill, your hair, your jeans, your, your clothes, whatever, your voice, your gift, 
uh, you're stealing from God. Um, you're actually um, standing in the way and you're distracting people from God. If you're worshiping God, you should be leading and doing it in a way that leads them to do the same thing and you fade out, you decrease, but he increases in your worship. Uh, I say that as an exhortation, not as a condemnation. So please forgive me if you took that as a condemnation. Um, I uh, pray for you. I hope you pray for me. I truly need it. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to getting this word and this message out there. And believe me, I, I did grab the third rail here and uh, uh, have experienced a lot of uh, resistance, a lot of pushback from a lot of different areas. So uh, God bless you. Uh, thank you again. And uh, bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.